We're all good. Okay. Uh, my name is Don Tsan. I, I work uh, as a researcher at Microsoft. Uh, and I'm the designer of the F-sharp language. And I'm going to be telling you today about something new that I did last year, uh, uh, sort of a unit of work, where we, uh, we took this fantastic programming language, F-sharp, and we applied it to the area of mobile and app programming. Getting some feedback there. Is it too loud on that? OK, thanks. Right, big thank you to loads of people who have been contributing to this work. We have uh, Timothy Rivière, who's the co-maintainer on the fabulous project. Uh, and lots of other people uh, have been giving great talks about the fabulous framework. And, I, and a huge call out to the, to, the, to the broader community. And also to other people in the F-sharp community who've worked on a system called Fable, which I mentioned at the bottom, and I'll be mentioning in my talk. And also to the Elm programming language. A lot of this is inspired by Elm. It's also heavily influenced by work going on in the OCaml world. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is just one of the main, main themes of this talk is about this you know, new renaissance that's going on in the application of functional programming to user interface, to app and user interface and web programming. And this is sort of part of a whole sort of tide of work that's suddenly making functional programming relevant in those application domains. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things I do on the side is to play uh, in, a, in, a, in a rock band of, 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 of sorts. This has been a new thing for me this year. Uh, this was Dylan and the Line Breakers. I'm actually off on the side somewhere. Uh, I didn't put myself up there. Uh, no need to do that. But this was us at NDC Oslo a few weeks ago. And I'm mentioning it for a reason. Uh, Dylan Beattie, who's a, the genius on the left, writes absolutely amazing parody songs uh, to do with the tech industry. And his, uh, you know, they are enormous fun to play. If, you, if you're going to have a conference and you need a band to really, you know, hit the mark with the tech audience, just give us a buzz. And we, especially if you're in London, and uh, we'll come along and, and perform. It's really just great, great fun. But it's also because his songs are actually really brilliant. And uh, this, this is one song. It'll probably blast out now. Does this play? Yeah, I don't know. I'll try playing this. But this song captures something essential about developers, which we absolutely love to build frameworks, right? They are these, and he uses the song, uh, we're going to, uh, we didn't start the fire by Billy Joel as the basis, because it's just entirely appropriate. The song goes on and on and on with uh, all the history of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, if the, the original song. And this song goes on with the, on and on and on with the history of developers making and building frameworks in order to help themselves be more productive, to help their communities more, be more productive, and to venture into new application uh, domains. And this is best viewed not as something not as building something that's eternal, uh, but as building something that's part of a river, part of the flow of our work, uh, the, the, the flow of life as, it, as, it, as, 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 as the, the you know, life goes on. Uh, so I do encourage you to, to, to check out Dylan and the Line Breakers and uh, the work of Dylan Beattie. It's, it's really great now if I can work out how to move that. OK, so I wrote a programming language, of course, so to help you know, developed uh, you know, the, the F-sharp programming language, but I, I actually haven't written that many frameworks. So I've been really excited over the last year to actually make Fabulous and to write my first uh, framework and to p participate in that river, river of life. But, I, but in order to position that work, I have to tell you a little bit about F-sharp. Uh, if you're interested in the early history of F-sharp, what it is, why, why it got started, uh, the history of programming language uh, submission, where uh, Phil Wadler is actually my shepherd for this to help me get it through the draft stage and into the conference stage. Uh, the draft is now available, fsharp.org slash history. You can read all the way back to 2003. Actually, the story begins way back in 1970 with the uh, origin of strongly typed functional programming in the work of Robin Milner 
Malcolm Newey and other people. And it's a great uh, rock and roll story all the way through the 70s and 80s uh, and, and, and 90s, uh, the formation of Microsoft Research and the arrival of a whole lot of strongly typed functional programming uh, aficionados uh, into the world of, of applied programming uh, at Microsoft Research in the early 2000s. The story of the object-oriented tidal wave it features very strongly that happened in the 1990s and so the reaction of the functional programming community to the notion of object-oriented programming, the many different reactions that happened and F-sharp is one of those reactions. It's similar to Scala is a reaction, an attempt to combine the streams of functional, strongly typed functional programming and, uh, and object-oriented programming in, in applied and practical settings. So please do check it out. It, get feedback to me as soon as possible because we're sort of finalizing down on the, on the next uh, iteration of, of this. So what is F-sharp today? Well, F-sharp, if you search around is the open source cross-platform functional language for .NET. So uh, the F-sharp type system does not have every single fancy addition uh, that you might find in, say, the Haskell system or in, or in some other strong, or in or Agda or some, whatever other strongly typed languages you want to choose. But it is an immensely practical set of choices. Uh, you know, the things we've included are all things which are, practically speaking, make a big difference in applied functional programming. Uh, so you could say it, 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 uh, starting with the core design of the of strongly typed functional programming, and then we add on a lot of extra interesting features, some of which are not found in other programming languages. Uh, uh, you can look at computation expressions in F-sharp, you can look at active patterns in F-sharp and their particular way that they're done and, and get heavily used because they're done in a way that is pragmatic and useful for actual applied programming. So that's, that's what we call F-sharp. F-sharp is actually, that's what Microsoft calls F-sharp. Uh, Microsoft are heavily involved in F-sharp today. Uh, but there are lots of other people who are involved too. And one group takes the alternative approach, which is that F-sharp is a JavaScript programming language. And that is the Fable uh, compiler for F-sharp, F-sharp to JavaScript. And this is a serious thing. It's got its own conference, right? In, and the conference is in Antwerp in uh, September. Uh, and you can use uh, F-sharp as your primary JavaScript language and serious bits of, of even the F-sharp tooling uh, is actually implemented using uh, this F-sharp to JavaScript compiler. So do check that out. And it, okay, uh, so just where we are, are now with F-sharp, F-sharp's open cross-platform, neutral, independent as a language. Uh, all the language and tooling is accepting contributions and the F-Sharp community is a very self-empowered organization. It has a, uh, there's the F-Sharp Software Foundation uh, and uh, it's set up similar to the Python Software Foundation. It has its own board uh, which is elected by the community each year and its own funding. Uh, that, so F-Sharp tools uh, for Android, iOS, Mac OS are provided through Xamarin. Uh, we have VS Code, Visual Studio for Windows and Mac, and .NET Core for Linux and OS X, and also JetBrains provide support in Rider as well. Uh, underneath it all, one of the reasons why we're able to deliver F-sharp tooling right across this spectrum of things is that the F-sharp compiler is built as a, as a component, F -sharp, the F-sharp compiler service component, a single library, a single DLL in the .NET world, uh, which can be used in all of these different settings and cross-compiled to JavaScript as well. And so that component is sort of powers both the compiler, the F-sharp interactive, the REPL, the, the, the tooling, the, 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 the REPLs in the browser that you get that run on the other client side or servant side and so on. So we have, uh, Fable, I mentioned Fable. There's also a, a sort of a full stack approach for F-sharp called Safe Stack. Uh, which takes both Fable for t on the client side and F-sharp and .NET on the server side, and it's a wonderful getting started point for, for, uh, you know, for building, uh, for if you're doing web programming with F-sharp, both server and client side. Now, all of that allows me to focus on my main job, which is the language design, and then these auxiliary work, like the, the work I'm talking about today. So we've just finished F-sharp 4.6, we have a language design process you can get involved in, RFCs and the like. Just uh, I won't go through these, but just to you can glance down what we did in F sharp 4.0, what we did in 4.1, 4.5, and then uh, 4.6. Just just 
recently. Okay. Uh, when, uh, so, so back in 2010, F Sharp was mostly associated with Visual Studio. It's now just got a very broad set of, uh, of, of editing and, 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 and tools. So v VS Code is a, the sort of main editing tool we use for cross-platform pro programming with F Sharp. And to say that F Sharp is absolutely, the, the future of .NET, if you hadn't realized, is absolutely focusing on cross-platform uh, cross working. Uh, Linux is incredibly important to, certainly important to Microsoft, but in terms of F Sharp as a language and .NET as a tool chain, where whoever contributes to it, uh, it's absolutely a cross-platform story. You can just create new apps and, and build them just using simple command line tooling like is shown there. Okay, but we're going to build a framework. So we'll, let's get back to that. No, I don't want to play it again. Done that bit. Okay. So in F Sharp, as described in the history of F Sharp paper, which I've mentioned, uh, F Sharp sort of embraced the idea of functional first programming, is what we described. Not functional programming, just alone. We're not, you know, we're willing to say the functional paradigm needs to be moderated. Functional first, then bring in elements of object-oriented design and bring in uh, ele elements of imperative programming for performance where necessary. So we had a great sort of opinion and methodology on, on functional first programming in general or say as applied to computational components. But probably the biggest mistake I made with F Sharp and the thing I didn't realize was how relevant functional programming is to UI programming. And if I could wind back time, uh, I, I think that would be where I'd focus a, a lot of previous energy. You know, there's always misspent energy that you, you, you wish you'd focus somewhere else. And uh, really, Elm, as I said, showed the way for applying functional programming to, to the web. Uh, Fable, uh, in the context of F Sharp, Fable takes the Elm programming model and applies it to web programming using React underneath. And that's great. But F Sharp devs also need to be able to do mobile and desktop app programming. And, and that's really what we're looking at here. OK, so historically, there's been these two competing camps. There's been this MVVM uh, model, view, view model approach uh, to, to user interface frameworks. And then there's been this sort of new world of emerging MVU uh, style with model view update. So we have React, React Native, Redux, Flux, Fable. And over on the left, you see all these old fashioned icons with blobs like GTK representing objects and, uh, and, and so on. And then these are all these uh, kind of new fancy sort of flowing icons. And there's no, 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 that's not actually complete coincidence because there's, there's a very different, this is a very object oriented approach. This is very information based approach to user interfaces. So uh, over on the left, uh, you t typically have object-oriented programming. You, you have complex and almost certainly mutable models. You, you have a, normally have a declarative static UI with a view uh, described very often in a second markup language. Uh, and you often have complex designer tooling. It, sort of the aim of having that second markup language is to have designer tooling which produces and works with that as its main document. And then somehow there's a connection, a binding to the code. Over on the left, you have functional programming, really. You have fairly simple declarative and often immutable models. Uh, you have a declarative UI which is written basically as a function which from the model to the UI and can therefore be dynamic. It can just say uh, it, the UI can change over time very easily. The, the UI is, the view is just generally described in the same language using a DSL in, this, in the programming language, in F Sharp or in, or in, or in the functional programming language or the, or the object oriented language being used in its functional programming mode. Uh, and typically the tooling uses simple live coding kind of tooling. So you develop the app as it's, sort of, as it's running. You edit and it reloads and, and so, on, so on, reapplies. Uh, okay, so 
in terms of information flow and so on, just summarising that again, you have the model, which is your business logic and data, you have your view model and presentation logic, and you have data binding uh, and the signal, a lot of sort of reactive signals going back and forth in the MVVM approach. In the MVU approach, it's much more this flow. You have the model, which gets rendered using a function to the view. A message comes and, uh, from the view, and you update the model, getting a new model, and you go around and around the loop. <coughs> OK. So just to say what does... Uh, there, there, it is, in, in that world of... In this world, there, there are many variations on the left. You've probably seen or seen different ones, whether you come from Apple, uh, I, I, the sort of the Objective-C programming model or whatever, whichever ones you've used over on the left. Uh, but XAML is one, uh, 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 one markup language. Obviously, HTML is another. Uh, this is what XAML looks like. So you have some user interface elements, and then you have this curly bracket binding parts everywhere to bind to the underlying programming objects in the underlying programming uh, code. Okay, so the problem is XAML uh, is... Let me, have, let me rant about XAML. Let me rant about this idea of having the view in a second language. In a way, I'm ranting about DSLs. Um, I'm ranting about use, people who carve off this thing into another DSL when this thing is actually alive and dynamic. The user interface is dynamic. People don't just expect a static user interface anymore. They expect their user interface to uh, re be related to the underlying model and, 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 and dynamism of the, of the code. Uh, so if, when you slice it off into a second language, it's like, like trying to rip your own skin off, right? And slice it off and then usably, and you sort of use it, uh, design with it or something. Uh, to, in order to make a tattoo. Now, you do the tattoo here. So, uh, XAML assumes designers as a slice off into a separate DSL, but XAML, that means XAML very often ends up, with stat ends up static. But because it, because it needs to be dynamic, they start adding other things in. They, they start adding templating in in order to recover the dyna dynamism. Then they, they say, well, let's actually make this thing into a programming language. Let's add behaviors, let's add converters. Uh, all these programming language-like things in order to be able to recover that dynamism. And to me, XAML is a, it really stems from a fundamental category mistake back in 2003, which is dynamic UI should be separated into a static markup language. You know? So you can just make that mistake uh, and, and continue way, way, way down a path. And all the different MVVM tooling has kind of done that same kind of mistake. So, uh, and and I, I don't think you end up in a good place, uh, especially given the huge amount of effort needed to make that path work. So uh, just to say, you can do MVVM in F-sharp if you want. The code ends up looking like this. It's pretty ugly. You have some mutable state up here. You have my, my view model up here, and you have some binding code of whatever kind of thing you need to do, the object-oriented uh, thing in F-sharp. Uh, F-sharp is actually a great object-oriented language, but, uh, but MVVM doesn't make it feel great. It's, it, it, it's just still kind of, kind of awful. Okay, so instead you do model view update, and uh, these slides are actually nicked from Yaron Minsky. I've put him down the bottom, his talk at Strange Loop, where he's talking about the same approach being applied to the DOM in, 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 in web programming. And uh, effectively, what happens is that you, each iteration you get a new model, you compute a new virtual DOM, you compute a diff between the old virtual DOM and the new one, and you send that and you apply that diff to actually a mutable, the actual mutable DOM in your, in your user interface, which then gets picked up by the rendering engine in the browser. Uh, okay, so does this add up? Uh, this, the, the, the key part here is that you're doing recomputation of the VDOM, and we'll talk more about further ways to make this even more efficient, uh, which we had not yet implemented in Fabulous. But actually, this really is, turns out pretty practical for, for, for a very wide range of information-based apps. OK, so what does it look like in code? I'm actually, yeah, OK, so what does it look like in code? We have all, all F-sharp 
fabulous and, and abstract like this. You have a type for the model, you have the type, union type for the messages, you have the initial model of some kind, you have an update function to process, and you have a view function which describes the, the view. This is, this is a, your app. Uh, this is exactly what I just said. And then we compute the view at the bottom. So you notice it's already a dynamic view. If the, if the button's been pressed, then we get one view. Uh, otherwise, we get another view. Okay, so the entire view can change when the person presses a button, you know, move to mode two, log in, whatever is the mode of the application, you just get a whole new different uh, view, view produced. So, for example, if the button was pressed, you said I was pressed, otherwise you say press me, and you dispatch the press message. So you do have some link back for that flow as it flows around, uh, and uh, so you can dispatch, you get the dispatch function as a, as a parameter, and you can call that dispatch function uh, there. And it's the same thing. So that means it's all functional programming. Updating the model is a functional programming. Your focus as you add a feature is what is your change in your core model, your core model and what states are representable and not representable in that model. Uh, the view is just functional programming from the model to these view elements, okay? Okay, it's all functional programming, and UI becomes an information problem, information flow. Uh, the views are, are recomputed as a model change and then differentially applied to the actual DOM. And uh, one great thing about this is not only all the usual benefits of functional programming, but it's a joy to unit test as well. Because you can unit test the update function separately, you can unit test the view function, you can pass in a mock dispatch function to capture and intercept the messages. Uh, and check that the view is responding to that. You can evaluate the view and check, do run queries down it to, to say if we're in a particular state, I expect there to be a login, a button that says login on it. They can examine the actual kind of view, logical view elements that are created. Okay, so for exa example, let's just take one example of this problem of static versus dynamic. So someone wants to work out how to do a knot in XAML. So they get onto the forums and they ask, you know, this is the bit I don't know how to do. If the, enable the button if the person is not logging in, okay? And uh, they get a reply, well, what you want is a converter. You need a negate Boolean converter, which you add to your XAML by downloading a new package, which contains a, a family-friendly set of converters are uh, all ready to do basic things like negating. And this is the definition of the converter. It negates a Boolean value each direction and so on. Uh, and, but it says that that's wrong because uh, they have to add the namespace to the XAML file in order to actually use that converter. Okay, uh, so, uh, okay, but in, in Fabulous, the view looks like this. It actually looks quite a lot like your previous, this, uh, this is the, that was for that XAML I showed earlier. Uh, so, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so how do you do a not here? Remembering you're just going to reevaluate. Well, actually, the can execute condition, whether the button is enabled or not, down the bottom right, well, you put a not down the bottom, right? You see that? There you go. You want a not, you just put a not. There's nothing to do, okay? The, so the view will get reevaluated. The can execute thing will change. That will be the only actual change to the, to the DOM. And, uh, and the button becomes inactive, as, you, as, as it should be. So b by s slicing off, you've created a vast amount of extra complexity, with, which doesn't really need to be there. Okay, so what do we need? We need the simplicity of MVU, but for mobile and desktop apps, and that's what Fabulous is about. And to get started, you just use .NET new Fabulous app uh, and give a name to it once you've installed the templates, and then you have your new app, and you can uh, run it. It's, uh, now, generally, I, 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 it, because of time pressure, I'm actually not going to do a, a live demo in this talk. I normally do a live demo. It's not a very complex one. It's where you start with an app like this, and you program away until you make a simple game, okay? Uh, it's available in my NDC Oslo talk, so no demo. Uh, but basically, it looks like this. We program, so you, this is my Android phone, this one here, uh, just with Visor running over, looking at the screen as it's plugged in. There's a live update mechanism that as you edit and each time you save the code, it reinstantiates the game. We don't yet recycle the state of the game, uh, so the game restarts to its beginning position. 
and uh, we program up a little memory game. Uh, you can make the game bigger and smaller, that you choose the size, and, and, it's, uh, and, and so on. OK, so just assume I've done that demo. Uh, coded away for, for 10 minutes, and you're welcome to look at my NDCL slow talk if you want to see, want to see it. OK, well, that's not, that's not very pretty, right? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a user interface designer, but there are lots of people who are, and you can just use CSS uh, with these design elements. One of the things that's, so underneath Fabulous, we use a system called Xamarin Forms, which runs everywhere. You can do Android apps with it. You can do iOS apps. Uh, you can do GTK apps. You can do WPF Windows apps. You can do UWP apps. You can do all, a huge, all these different kinds of apps with Xamarin Forms. So that means Fabulous can do all of those things as well. And you can use CSS to do the designing and, and styling. OK, here are some sample apps. I'll let you take, talk about a couple of these. So just a sample game app on the left, similar to the one we program up. The sample contacts app uh, called uh, Fabulous Contacts. This is called Fabulous Planets. It's using a 3D uh, rendering uh, and animation system called Urhu. Uh, and uh, here is the maps part of the um, up on the top right, the maps part of the contacts app. They're showing the, you can do maps integration and very simple to use your view specification. It's just your, lo your sort of location and the pins you want shown on the map. And also the plotting uh, integration down on the bottom right. Okay. Uh, Elmish contacts. This is the best app to learn from for people like you who are nearly all of, um, of you, I, I, I assume, are familiar with functional programming. Uh, so because that same shape that I described in the app is very visible in this app, but it's a multi-page app. It includes database integration, includes maps integration, includes asynchronous data loading onto the maps. Uh, it includes some th things like sending SMSs, making phone calls, using a library called Xamarin Essentials. Uh, and it includes editing, searching lists, taking photos, splash screens, and it's got a decent, pretty decent design. So that's it. Please just start there. Uh, right. OK. Right, just to say animations. Uh, uh, so the, the view function is uh, sort of is the functional programming specification of what the view should look like at any particular point in time. But uh, we don't take a time parameter in that view function. There's no t there. And, we, uh, and so you think, how do you do animations? Uh, you don't want animations to have a very high update rate. You don't want to be going around that loop on every step of the animation. Uh, and so we take the same approach as React which is uh, to treat animations effectively as sort of the side effects or imperative, uh, imperative actions. And so you'll see this used these refs here, such as this animated label ref. And then during the update function, when you get the poked message, you actually check there's something in that. And then you spark off a rotate action, giving the amount of time that thing will run for and the degrees it rotates through. And then you ignore. So, it's a, so, so sparky off an animation is a side effect. If the user interface element disappears or is modified before the animation is, uh, if it's modified, it's okay. If it's if it's elim if it's destroyed uh, because it's no longer necessary in the view, then that animation will no longer be be running. It will be ended prematurely. Okay, uh, multi-page apps. I mentioned uh, fabulous contacts as an example. Same model applies. Uh, you're just rendering, instead of the view function giving one page back, it gives back all the currently visible pages. Uh, OK. Uh, and there, there are lots of pragmatics, and they're all covered in the um, fabulous docs. So you have state persistence, et cetera, app size, platform specifics, deploying them, and the crucially extensibility. So it takes you through the examples of how we add maps in into uh, as an extension into fabulous and you can do that for any any extensions which are available in in this xamarin universe 
and i mentioned xamarin essentials that covers loads of things like sending emails, connectivity, a compass, battery everything, all the things we're used to on the phone that drive a lot of the, the, the logic of apps your, 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 your geolocation and, 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 and so on and so that's all available uh, and orthogonal really to, to Fabulous itself okay so how do we make this efficient as it actually for, 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 for simple information apps like uh, Elmish, uh, Fabulous Contacts, it's actually totally, you don't need to do anything. The differential, up, the view recomputation and the differential update is enough to make it efficient. But uh, you can do, you can incrementalize the view uh, in, in, in fairly simply. And first of all, you've got to realize the view is returning a tree of immutable data. This view dot slider and so on. It's just a, it's just a DSL to give you a tree of data. Uh, a lot of property bags underneath. Uh, and we'd rather not reallocate and retraverse that data on each model update. Okay? So what, one way to incrementalize is to use depends on. It's a helper function we provide. And you list in the things that a chunk of the view depends on. This depends on you, the model.count and the model.step. Inside, you get access to the count and the step, and the model actually gives given a type that you can't access. It, it's just an idiom. You can, there are ways to break this. Of course, you can, you can rebind the model and give it a different name and so on. But the idea is, is you just say, the, if these change, then we're going to reevaluate the view. It uses a hash table underneath to store, to, add, to, to, to do that lookup. So that's pretty good. Uh, th so that recycles a subtree uh, that are unchanged. And if the subtree is unchanged, you get exactly the same pointer as last time. And you don't re-traverse that in any diffing. And so you can do a lot with this basic te technique to, to incrementalize. So it's good enough for many information apps. However, and this is really where I think it opens the door to a set of research opportunities, uh, or applied research, really. Uh, w which is that we can incrementalize this further. And I've been really taken by this talk of Yaron Minsky uh, where at Strange Loop last year, where they show the use of a system called self adjusting computations, which is really incre incremental immutable data structures in OCaml. And uh, they show it to give high performance web UI. Uh, and I'm really pleased with this work because, you know, I was following the work on self-adjusting computations and thinking this is really interesting, really fundamental in functional programming, what they're, what they're doing here. This is back about five or six years ago. And uh, to be honest, I actually advocated at Microsoft Research that we should hire in some of these pe people because it looks important. And I really wish we had uh, because uh, it is, we didn't think it was going to be relevant to user interface programming. We were thinking about relevance to big data or Hadoop programming, whatever was the thing back then. Uh, but it is relevant to UI. And if uh, the OCaml people have shown you can take these self-adjusting uh, or incremental immutable data structures and you can push the diff effectively to here so that the model includes, includes its incremental nature by construction or by or by transformation and then you everything becomes incremental through the um, through the through the stack and that that will make this really very sweet in terms of UI performance uh, it so it does make me wonder if there are a set of other uh, sort of PL based techniques which could be applied now we've got functional programming for the UI Maybe we should be looking at the provide, uh, you know, applying analysis. Uh, what, what, what's the best kind of typing to be applied in, the, in this setting? Um, uh, uh, w w what does it mean to check for correctness of these, of the, automatically check for correctness of these programs? Uh, uh, <coughs> what does it mean to sy synthesize some parts of it? I've never, I, haven't, I haven't got those answers to any of those, but maybe now we're in the realm of functional programming, programming in a practical environment, maybe we can uh, start to look at it. Okay. Uh, so how might that, this look in F sharp? Well, one, one approach is to use F sharp quotations uh, so that uh, the, we put, re reflect the definition, which means that at runtime, the sort of the, 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 the S expressions for all of the content of the program 
are, avail is av are available and then we have this make incremental app down below and then it, that would, act, as the app started, would effectively analyze the program for its incremental updates in the update function and then uh, work out the incremental view of the view function down, down below. The, uh, and then there's a separate set of work to push that to um, compile time instead of at runtime, but it's, it would be similar, similar fundamental logic. So can we incrementalize the app between, by just doing that? That would be the ideal. Okay, so to summarize, I've told you a little bit about F-sharp, clear code to solve real-world problems. I've told you that MVU makes functional programming very relevant to UI, uh, and that that message is being starting to spread even to the deep depths of Microsoft, where I've talked about this, to the people who provide the UI frameworks to about half the world's programs. So we're starting to spread this around. And uh, Fabulous brings it to cross-platform apps, and there are some kind of applied R&D opportunities to, for this incremental immutable data for, for Hyperf. And that's all. Thanks very much. <laughs> and we've got about five minutes of questions, if, if we have that many. Yes, please. Um, if one compiles an F-sharp fabulous app for, say, uh, iOS or Linux, GTK or what have you, um, does it get compiled into native machine code uh, with native UI widgets or does it run in some kind of uh, bytecode VM uh, or in the way that, say, React apps or Java apps might run? Uh, I, I, I actually don't know the full details of that for each different platform for... Um, uh, Effectively, on Android, you've effectively got a .NET runtime as part of your app uh, with a, a link down reduced .NET runtime. It's the mono runtime, but uh, which uh, that's really the main use of the mono runtime these days. Now the .NET uh, core exists for Linux. So uh, on iOS, it, it's it's similar. There used to be more restrictions on iOS, uh, but. Uh, these days, that there seem to be very few restrictions on what you can do on device on, on iOS. So. How, performant, how performant is it in iOS compared to a native app written in, say, Swift or Objective-C? Uh, I, I don't know the performance of it in terms of uh, I, I expect you to get equivalent perf. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Um, what's the what are the relationships between uh, Fable and Fabulous? Uh, the oh, code so, and the so, people. so Fable is a similar MVU programming model, but for web programming and uses React underneath. Okay. Uh, so it, you're, it's compiled to JavaScript, but the programming model, what the, an app looks like, is, is basically the same. Uh, for, uh, for Fabulous is, the, as I said, the same model, but uh, actually assuming a .NET runtime underneath, assuming yeah, so really, and there are enough differences there. We did think about trying to make them identical, but the, the, the JavaScript leaks into the Fable programming model, and the, the, the underlying Xamarin forms or the existence of that does, does leak into the core Fabulous programming model. So we're not, we're not going to completely unify these, but you can, you, what you learn in one, you can totally apply to the other uh, in terms is, of technology. Is there a relationship with the people behind both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, you have both have a shared goal of keeping the models the same? Yeah, it's certainly the conceptual models are absolutely the same. We, and there are some people involved in both. And the, um, yeah, it's, it's very, very friendly. But, but in terms of syntactic correct, uh, we won't make the exact same programs run, run. There tends to be enough differences in the, the view descriptions are different. Okay, so the, you know, we use this, what's effectively XAML written as an F-sharp DSL, uh, which I showed you elements of. In the fabulous world, in the Fable world, it'll feel much more familiar to the, the HTML programmer. All the names will be named after HTML elements. Yes, Phil. One of the nice things in F Sharp is data providers. And I was expecting you to show how data providers play nicely with Fabulous and make it 
Yeah, you know, ac actually, so, so yeah, there's we so the, the mechanism we normally call them type providers, but yes, Sorry, the, 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 the purpose say. of type providers is to give strongly typed access to external data sources. But actually, no, we don't need them here. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're, there's, 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 you, you can use a type provider in a fabulous app, and you can use the, to, in order to ingest your your data or uh, totally. But but we in the core fabulous framework, we haven't needed to use them. I mean, I'm tempted to when I look at this kind of thing and we think about lifting this to compile time. I mean, type providers are a form of compile time metaprogramming. Okay, specifically aimed at that data, giving strong type into data. But we could make uh, this thing run at compile time as a, effectively a very advanced macro. Uh, uh, and and that, that would be, we would do that by extending the whole type provider mechanism to allow sophisticated macros at compile time to incrementalize your app. But that, that's more tactical about how that thing gets implemented. I was just expecting some app like, you know, here's how you do all of IMDB or all of Wikipedia in three lines using a type provider. Right, right. We could do that. You could absolutely do that. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, totally. That's not mine. That, I, I'm just talking about the core framework. But I've given so many, so many type provider talks, Phil. I'm actually quite glad not to give another one for, for, a, for a little talk about something else for a little bit. They're an amazing mechanism, but I, I deliberately didn't tie that into the story. So when uh, writing native uh, Android applications, one of the more difficult things to get right is the life cycle. And so um, the, the new uh, the, the libraries with live data and the MVVM uh, framework actually provide you a very nice way in order to uh, not have to deal with large parts of the life cycle. So um, do you also um, provide something similar or, or how does uh, how yeah, do you I, so, deal with it? So Xamarin provides a point of, Xamarin Forms, which we sit on, provides a point of view on life cycle and state persistence. Uh, but uh, I, I do know, what, there are, I, I have seen the documentation pages on Android life cycle for Xamarin programmers. You would apply exactly the same techniques here, and I, I, uh, but I haven't done it myself to the full extent of like all the, all the, all the different parts of what that means. But uh, I am confident that, so, so if there's, I'm confident that the basic model will actually work very nicely with this in terms of, uh, but the, um, uh, sometimes you need some platform specifics for Android. Uh, and iOS as well, and and there's a way to declare bits of bits of logic that are only relevant to one platform or the other. Yeah. Uh, right. Any more questions? Yeah, one more. One more question. You mentioned that you have to make a concession to mutability when you have to deal with animations, which is um, but yeah, you like to to sort of seeing animations as a side effect. Yeah, yeah. because you. Like we don't want to run that loop too many times with the time parameter. Yep. Um, which is, I think, is that like FRP kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. You get yeah. you. Yeah, this is in many ways uh, kind of a non-FRP approach to UI. Yes. Right. Totally. The so incremental version of it is very FRP-like, but yeah. So do you Im foresee, for example, with the incremental stuff, if that gets performant enough, you could switch to that sort of style? Well, my, my, my problem is more with the, the programming model uh, uh, that um, uh, people, it, it, it's the same with any temporal logic, any temporal, temporal programming. There's so many different views on time and often they coincide within the same application uh, that it can be, even, it, it's not like functional programming actually provides a magic wand to that. That code there Ignoring that try, the, the try value thing, which is guarding against some startup condition, simply saying, just rotate it for two seconds. You know, that's about as clear as it gets, right? And, and, and it, so the, my, my problem with FRP and, and to some parts of the Re ReactiveX and the like is that um, it's, it's really complex, yeah? I mean, they're doing complex things, but uh, um, 
uh, yeah, so even if we could make it performant enough, which, are, which is hard, uh, oh, well, don't forget these, these UI frameworks normally have their own animation sub-languages anyway, so even in MVVM, uh, that's not even fast enough to do the animation, right? They, 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 there's a DSL hidden inside the MVVM thing which hands off animations to the actual presentation system. So, um, yeah, so in a way, no. I guess the answer on performance is no alternative presentation layer needs to and own animation. Just to make sure I understand, because you think the FRP stuff is just a little, like, it's not as pleasant a programming model, in your opinion? Uh, I, I'd say that the programming language needs to, the, the, the app programming language needs to get out of the core animation loop and leave it up to the, it's a bit like a database. We don't get into the core loop of the database query. We don't get into the core loop of the animation, uh, of the animation loop. That's not, yeah, as, as app developers. Cool. Okay, we're done. So one more question here. Okay. Uh, one short question. How about debugging? Uh, one slide, uh, one of your slides mentioned the, the time travel de debugging. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, uh, that just means, so because your, your model is generally speaking functional data, immutable data, then to, to, to go back in time, you just reset the model, recompute the view, and your app is back where it was. Uh, and uh, so most of these React-like systems have some debugging tools, often graphical uh, or built into the app, which allow you to sort of step back through the history, backwards and forth over the history of the app, and that's immensely useful to actually be able to deb debug it. Uh, but it's very easy to implement in the MVU model. Okay. Uh, oh, thanks.